Today we're going to talk about our first concept past an atom. You know, there's about a hundred or so different elements and atoms, and the universe would be a pretty boring place if that's all there was, was a hundred different things. But what makes the universe exciting and interesting is that those atoms can combine in a variety of different ways to make different compounds. Now, there are two major types of compounds that we are going to be talking about this year, ionic and covalent. Uh, you can make an argument that there are, you know, hybrids in there, other slightly different, you know, modified variations. But the two major classes that we're going to be talking about are ionic and covalent. And one of the easier ones to look at is the idea of ionic compounds. Now, in case you were not aware, the element sodium is a soft white metal that when you put it into water, it explodes, right? Um, the element chlorine is a green poisonous gas. You breathe it in, it creates hydrochloric acid in your lungs, which is bad. Your lungs try to then dilute that hydrochloric acid um, by putting uh, water in there, and you end up drowning to death on dry land because your lungs fill up with water trying to stop the uh, chlorine gas. So that sounds awful. So, But if you take an explosive uh, metal and a poisonous gas and put them together, you get sodium chloride, which is just the salt that you put on your french fries. And that's not harmful to anybody, unless, of course, you have like high blood pressure or something like that. So... <clears throat> Obviously, sodium chloride salt has very different properties than the sodium that it comes from or the chloride that it comes from. And if you look at it, it makes these little tiny little crystals here. And if you notice, they are all little cubes. And the interesting thing about this is, is it's not like, you know, scientists have a little machine that, that, that cuts them into these cubes. Those atoms know to go together to make these cubic shapes. Well, how in the heck can they know to do that? Well, let's take a look at what happens here. So we know sodium, and again, you might want to have a periodic table out for this. Sodium has 11 electrons. It's got two in the first shell. It's got eight in the next shell, and then it's got one in its valence shell. So sodium is two, eight, and one. So in order to become stable and have that noble gas configuration, it is going to lose its outermost electron here. So that guy is going to go away. So again, here's this guy here. There's its valence electron. It's going to go away. And now it just has 2 and 8, which is a noble gas configuration. And in doing so, it gains a positive 1 charge. So the sodium atom becomes the sodium ion. Now, <clears throat> this positive charge is an electromagnetic charge, and it emanates in all directions. It emanates up, it emanates down, left and right, and if I could, I'd have it come out of the screen at you and go back into the screen. So it emanates in all directions. And the same thing is occurring, by the way, for the chloride, except that the chloride is not positive. The chloride ends up being a negative one charge. Uh, again, if you check out your periodic table, chlorine is 2, 8, and 7. So it, it's the one that's going to want to get that electron from sodium, 2, 8, and 1. Sodium gives up its one electron to go over here, and now that 7 becomes an 8, which is why, again, the chlorine becomes a negative 1 charge there. But the chloride becomes a negative 1 charge, and it emanates its negativity like the sodium does in all directions, up, down, left, right, in, out, and so forth. <clears throat> and that would be fine if there was only one sodium and one chloride there, except that that never happens. There's always spajillions of them. And so when that occurs, you now have a bunch of positives and a bunch of negatives that line up next to each other. So positives attract negatives, which attract positives, which attract negatives. Positives attract negatives, which attract positives, which attract negatives. Negatives attract positives, and so forth and so on. And you can see they alternate back and forth in this crystal uh, pattern here. And not only do they do it in two dimensions, left and right, but they also do it top to bottom, because again, don't forget that they goes up and down as well. And so what you end up with is you end up with this guy here, which is known as an ionic crystal lattice. And all that is is a three-dimensional structure of alternating positive and negative cations and anions. So salt knows to go to these cubic shapes because 
<coughs> of the specific charge and size arrangement of the sodium and the chlorine, they go together to make these cubes. Now, it would be oversimplistic to say that the only thing that is made is cubes. If we take a look at the next page, there's all sorts of different ionic shapes that are made. There is alum that makes kind of these triangles with the tips cut off. All manner of different uh, shapes are made. And if you really want to get into that, then go to graduate school about, you know, crystallography and things like that. But we're not going to get into why these different shapes are as they are. But we are, what we are going to do is we are going to talk about some of the properties. And again, here is a definition, crystal lattice. It's just positive and negative ions held together by opposite charges in a three-dimensional lattice. All right, so what we've got now is we are going to compare a bunch of different ionic compounds. So what we are doing is we are measuring the lattice energy. And lattice energy, for lack of a better term, is just how much energy it takes to tear the crystal apart. So for sodium fluoride, it takes 926 kilojoules for every mole of sodium fluoride to tear it apart. That's great in everything, but let's examine what happens um, when we compare different substances. So first of all, let's look at it in the big picture of things here. Do you notice how these four tend to be in the hundreds? Do you notice that these four tend to be in the thousands? And do you notice that these four tend to, or these two tend to be in the tens of thousands? Well, what is the difference between them? Well, examine the the obvious differences between them and that's their charges check it out all of these are plus one minus one all of these are charges of plus two minus two a stronger positive charge and a stronger negative charge and the stronger positive charge and negative charge for the green examples here leads to a stronger lattice energy than what we saw for the plus one and the minus one and then that trend continues. The negative charge is the same, but the positive charge has gone up to a plus three, and you'll notice that the lattice energy is increased as well. So one of the factors that can affect the lattice energy is obviously the charge, and it's pretty obviously a direct relationship. As you go from plus ones to plus twos to plus threes, the lattice energy increases as well. As you go from negative ones to negative twos, and were we to do negative three, that would increase as well. So basically, the idea here is that lattice energy is proportional to ionic charge. So if you are being asked to compare two different substances, plus ones are gonna be less than plus twos, are gonna be less than plus threes, are gonna be less than plus fours. This guy is weaker, this guy is stronger. And the same is true on the negative side of things. A negative one is the weakest negative charge. A stronger negative charge is negative two, a stronger negative charge is negative three, and a stronger negative charge is negative four. So the strongest negative charge is negative four, the strongest positive charge is positive four, and the weakest negative charge is negative one, and the weakest uh, positive charge is positive one. This follows right along with what we already knew about things from the um, idea of Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law tells us that the force is proportional to Q1, Q2 divided by the radius squares, squared. Well, Q1 and Q2 are the charges. And so if you've got two different charges up here, the stronger the charges, the stronger the force, because again, those charges are in the numerator of Coulomb's law here. So lattice energy is proportional to the ionic charge. But Coulomb's law also has a factor of the radius that is here. So what is happening with that? Well, let's take a look at four examples. First of all, let's take a look here. They are sodium fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide. They all have sodium in them. But this is fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide. And if you find those on the periodic table, they are here, fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide. Here, one, two, three, four, right? And what do we know about what happens to atoms as you go down a periodic table? 
Well, as you go down the periodic table, you get further and further shells out. Fluorine is in the second row, which means it is at the second energy shell. Chlorine is in the third energy level, which means it's at the third energy shell. Bromine would be in the fourth energy shell. Oopsie. The fourth energy shell. And iodine would be in the fifth energy shell. So they get bigger as you go down the column. So these guys here are bigger in size. This is a smaller size. And what happens then to the lattice energy? Well, let's take a look. Fluorine is the smallest size. So again, if we use these guys for comparison here, <coughs> iodine is the biggest one. Bromine is smaller. Chlorine is even smaller. And fluorine is even smaller than that. And as you get bigger and bigger and bigger in the size, the lattice energy goes down and down and down. So that makes sense as well. Because remember, in Coulomb's Law, what does it say? It says, I'll redo it here. Coulomb's Law says the force is going to be equal to the charges in the numerator divided by the distance in the denominator. Well, if the denominator goes up, then the force is going to go down. So as these ions get larger and larger and larger, the lattice energy gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So notice that as these guys here get big, the lattice energy gets small, which again reinforces Coulomb's law. This is a small ion and it has a big lattice energy. So our second factor here is this guy here, which says that lattice energy is going to be inversely proportional to the ionic size. So the strongest crystals are going to be ones that are the smallest in size, but have the largest charge. So the overall trend here for these guys, strong crystals are going to be ones that have big charge, but small size. Those are the strongest crystals. So then obviously the weakest crystals are going to be ones with the smallest charge, but the largest size. Now they could ask you the same, they could ask you about lattice energy, or they could ask you uh, a number of other factors, uh, one of which is the melting point. Well, the melting point is just how much temperature it takes to tear apart a crystal. So melting point and lattice energy are basically the same kind of thing here. If you've got a high lattice energy, you're going to have a high melting point. If you've got a low lattice energy, you're going to have a low melting point. So let's take a look at these four. You'll notice that the lattice energy here is the highest, its melting point is the highest. The lattice energy here is the lowest, its melting point is the lowest. Here. So generally speaking, if you have a strong crystal with a high lattice energy, it's going to have a relatively high melting point. If you have a weak crystal with a low melting point, um, it's probably because it has a small lattice energy. Take a look at these three examples here. So <clears throat> this one is a plus one minus one. That is the weakest of them. This one here is a plus two minus two. It is the strongest of them. The weakest one has the weakest lattice energy and the smallest melting point. The strongest one has the highest lattice energy and the highest melting point. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that this is uh, a perfect system and it works every single time. I'm sure if you're watching this video, you can find examples that don't work for this. But generally speaking, on the AP chemistry test, if they are going to ask you to compare different substances, they're going to ask you ones that work and follow the rules. They're not going to get into any exceptions on any of those things. So overall, generally speaking, it's very easy. Lattice energy is directly proportional to the charge but inversely proportional to the size and the melting point is directly proportional to the lattice energy. So 
substances that have a high charge are going to have a high lattice energy and a high melting point. Substances that have a low charge are going to have a low lattice energy and a low melting point. And then everything is backwards for the size. Substances that have a large size for their ions are going to have a low lattice energy and a lower melting point and the substances that have a low size are going to have a high lattice energy and a high melting point.